Amen. What a beautiful song for the beginning of Advent, reminding us where our hope is and that when we wait on the Lord, He always comes through. He's always faithful. And that's really the message of Advent, that this God who promised to send a Messiah, a Savior, was good on His word, that He can be trusted and that we have, because Jesus came, hope, hope beyond any hope that this world offers. And so we look forward to this Advent season, these next four weeks to contemplate, to remember, to think, to pray, to read, to anticipate, but more than anything, to be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus. Because he came, we have hope. Because God is a God of his word, we can trust him and we can trust our lives to him. We can trust our eternity to him. I want to also, just uh, say thank you all for your prayers over the last several weeks, and thank you for your interest in our family, our growing family, and we appreciate all the encouragement and prayers, but it is good to be back. It's good to be home, and uh, one of these days, uh, I'll catch up on my sleep. If I fall asleep during my sermon, uh, someone tap me quietly and wake me up so that I can finish. Um, we're still a little bit in the throes of jet lag, but not too bad. But thank you so much for your prayer and support. Um, as you leave today, um, my family, K.E., Kelsey, Caleb, and Caden will be at the doors, and we've kind of made this an annual tradition of our family, just a very small way of saying thank you for the privilege of serving as your pastor. We want to give you our annual Christmas devotional and recipe book. And uh, this has been a fun thing for our family to put together now for the last six years. And uh, not only does it have an Advent preparation reading for each Sunday's sermon, but it also has some of our family's favorite recipes in here. And it's one of the, uh, one of the blessings I really get a kick out of listening to some of you saying, that was a great recipe. Some of you saying, oh, I didn't like that at all. Um, I've, it's been fun to hear some of you. Uh, have incorporated this into your traditions at the Christmas season, and uh, it's just a joy to share that with you. So as you leave today, um, again, Katie, Kelsey, and Caden will be at the doors, and if you could take one per family, that would be wonderful. And then you can just, as you prepare for each Sunday's um, worship service, you can follow along, and there's a brief devotional talking about what we're going to be talking about on Sunday mornings. And what are we going to be talking about on Sunday mornings during the Advent season? We're going to be talking about the Christmas story, and we're going to be talking about how we as Christians can defend and have faith and trust in the supernatural elements of our faith, and in particular of the Christmas story. I entitled the entire series, The Christmas Story, Are You Kidding Me? Because there are many people out in our culture, there are many people in the world who are very skeptical, who are very materialistic, who are very humanistic, who look at the Christmas story, have no problem with the touchy-feely elements of it, but when they're confronted with what we believe, when we, as we sang today, believe in the virgin birth, when we believe that Jesus is God, when we believe these things to be true, they look at us and they say, are you kidding me? Are you serious? Do you really believe those things? Over the next four weeks, we're going to be just talking about ways that we can have confidence in the supernatural elements and truth that we talk about during the Christmas season, during the Easter season, during really the conversations about our faith. Because as much as we can say we have a reasonable faith, as much as we will look at over the next four weeks the different evidences for the Christian faith and for the supernatural elements of the Christian and faith to be reasonable to believe, we are unapologetically a people of faith. We are unapologetically placing our faith in an unseen God. But we're thankful that this unseen God has given us a beautiful record in Scripture through archaeology, through logic, through experience for us to know that our faith is reasonable. This morning we're going to look at really the basic question that we need to ask ourselves, and it's this. Can we really believe all those crazy stories? Can we really look at the supernatural elements in particular of the Christmas story, and can we really believe them? Next week, we're going to speak specifically about the claim that Jesus was born of a virgin. And we're going to answer the question, can Jesus really have been born of a virgin? The next week, we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies. 
We're going to ask the question, how could one man really fulfill all of those prophecies? And then we're going to wrap up our series by answering the question, was Jesus really God in the flesh? I mean, when we look at all of the elements, when we look at all of the evidence, can we with confidence and in faith say we believe that Jesus is who he said he was? Now, there are all kinds of different people in our culture and probably all kinds of different people even in this room on a spectrum of what you believe about the supernatural elements of the Bible's stories, the story of Jesus, the Christmas story. Everywhere from some of you here saying, I believe, I have complete confidence, to some of you here saying, I really don't believe this. It's a, it's a collection of fairy tales and myths. Probably most of us in this room fall somewhere in between saying, I believe, but I struggle sometimes with being able to defend that. I struggle sometimes with the stories. Can we really believe that they're true or do they really need to be true for us to have a Christian faith? That's one of the most damaging uh, kind of ways that liberal Christianity and even people who aren't Christian but who are sympathetic towards Christianity try to paint the Christmas story and the supernatural elements. They will say things like, oh, the supernatural elements aren't true, but the truths that they teach are still valid. I read an article this week from The Guardian by Theo Hobson, and this is what I think is a reflection of much of what our culture, who isn't anti-Christian necessarily, but who doesn't believe in the supernatural, would say about the Christmas story. He writes, of course, it's a fairy tale. There's a magic star and magical beings. There's a magic child born in magical circumstances. There's an evil king, a couple of epic journeys, and a colorful supporting cast of refined mystic and rugged shepherds. No one takes the Christmas story seriously, right? Well, they should. We all should. And we should do so not despite all the magic and mysticism and woo, but because of it. Now listen to this liberal argument for dismissing the supernatural, but still somehow believing the message. He goes on to write, in these post-enlightenment times, anything that sits outside a rationalist understanding of the world can be all too easily dismissed. There are two ways in which this can damage our ability to appreciate the Christmas story. It can lead us to try to pry the supernatural away from the physical, or it can lead us to regard the whole thing as nonsense. The problem is that in following either course, we risk missing out on something that really matters, truth. Now, do you just see what this author, along with many of our culture, has done? They have just redefined truth. We would say that truth, of course, is understanding the Bible as being real, the stories of the supernatural being legitimate and literal, that we can believe that a God who could create is also a God who could cause his son to be born of a virgin, who could do miracles. Let me finish this last paragraph from this Guardian article. It says, it may seem strange to invoke truth in the case of a story that seems preposterous to many, but in matters outside religion, we remain capable of understanding that truth is not always the same as fact. No one would say the works of Shakespeare are worthless because they are fabrications. Instead, we appreciate that they are infused with truth. Now, I read that not to make some of you doubt more or bring more questions in, in your head, but to present what I think, again, is the most prevalent argument from a culture, especially a liberal Christian culture or a part of a culture that isn't anti-Christian but is very anti-supernatural, doesn't believe in the truth claims of the Bible. This is a prevalent argument that you will hear on university campuses that your children are hearing in high school. This is the argument that you'll read as you go on the internet and type in, can we believe the Christmas story? So what do we do with that as Bible-believing Christians? Because we will say, as those who believe the word, that it is not only truth in these pages, but it is also fact. We look throughout the New Testament and the Gospels, and we can see that Jesus himself regarded, he regarded the truth of the Bible as literal truth. 
We understand that as we celebrate Easter, it's not enough to just say we believe in resurrection power, but we say as a cornerstone of our faith, as a requirement for being a genuine believer, we believe that Jesus died and that he literally was risen from the dead. We as a Christmas people say we not only believe that God in some supernatural magical sense invaded the world with truth and kindness, we believe that he came as a baby in a manger born of a virgin, God in the flesh. So as Bible-believing Christians, we believe the word of God to be true and accurate. We affirm not only the accuracy of what is reported in it, but we affirm the supernatural elements of the story. We hold on to, and this is the verse that will really undergird what we talk about for the next four weeks. It's 2 Timothy 3, 16, and we know it well. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So what I want to do today is really just kind of set the table, just kind of lay the foundation for what we're going to be talking about over the next three weeks And I'm going to be honest with you, what I'm going to present to you is really just going to be appetizers. We could literally talk weeks and weeks and months about how to defend our faith, the evidence for our faith. I don't want you to look at this as a Christmas meal. I want you to look at this as a walk through Costco. The samples are real, but they're not a meal. The samples are intended to make you say, hmm, I'm going to buy the whole box. Now, I can make a meal out of Costco samples, but that's, that's beside the point. What I want to challenge you is as we look at some of the basics of defending our faith, of understanding why our faith is reasonable, my challenge and my hope is that it will cause you to dig deeper. If you're here and you believe, I hope that you take this challenge to go and learn an even better way to articulate your faith. I hope if you're here and you completely don't believe, that you will at least have an open mind and say, could there be a supernatural? And could this Bible contain a a correct picture of the reality of a supernatural God? And if you're here like most who believe but may struggle, I hope this just whets your appetite to dig a little bit deeper. That you could leave here maybe not being Ravi Zacharias, ready to write an apologetic book, but leaving here over these next four weeks with a confidence that says, you know what, I can believe the word of God. I can believe the supernatural elements. And even more, I want to learn more and dig deeper on my own. So this morning, I want to answer the question, can we believe these crazy stories? As we look at the next few weeks about the supernatural elements of Christmas, can we believe these crazy stories? In other words, can we rely on the Bible as being accurate and trustworthy? This morning, very quickly, I want us to look at five types of evidence for the trustworthiness of the Bible. I encourage you to jot notes But I also encourage you over the next few weeks to dig deeper on your own. And to help you with that, as you leave uh, on the Welcome Center, we have enough copies for at least one per family or more of a great little booklet called The Case for Christmas by Lee Strobel. And my encouragement is and our hope is that every single family, every couple, every individual will leave with one of these today. There's plenty for our entire church family. And this is just a very basic overview of some of the things that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. And so let's look this morning at the evidence, five types of evidence for the trustworthiness of the Bible. The first evidence that we see that causes us to be able to trust the Bible so that we can begin to trust the supernatural elements of the Bible and of the Christmas story is, number one, the manuscript evidence the manuscript evidence. And what do we mean by the manuscript evidence? What we're talking about is the evidence, the good evidence that we have based on all of the different manuscripts of Scripture. Because many people will say, oh, do we even know if the Bible is true? When was the Bible written? The Bible has changed so much over 
many years of it being translated. I don't even remember what daytime talk show that I was listening to, uh, maybe even this last week, where the host basically said, oh, the Christmas story or Christianity. The Bible's been translated so many times, we don't even have an accurate picture of the original manuscript. Well, the reality is that nothing could be further from the truth. Now, we do not have in our possession the actual original autographs. In other words, the letters that Peter actually wrote, we don't have those. We don't have the actual first-hand editions of the Gospels. But what we do have is an amazing collection of manuscripts that are not only huge in number, but are amazingly closely uh, dated to the original autographs. We have about 5,800 or so full and partial copies of the Greek New Testament. And just as a reminder for some of you, or maybe some of you don't know, the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation, was not written in English. It was originally written in Greek. And we have well over 5,800 original, partial, or full manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. And what is incredibly amazing about that is some of those copies have been dated as close to the autograph as 25 to 40 years from the time that the original authors wrote either the epistles or the gospels. That is an amazing historical truth that we have. One of those amazing ongoing archaeological discoveries that we keep finding. More and more copies of the manuscripts closer and closer to the date of them originally being written. Now, some may say, well, 25 or 40 years, that's a long time. But what we don't realize is that when we look at other works of antiquity, that general scholarship will say are reliable, that we would say are accurate. We see that with some of the, the most relied upon ancient manuscripts, there are as few as 400 copies or partial copies. Everything from what Homer wrote or some of the uh, historians of ancient Greece or Plato, some of those works that we rely upon now, some of those works have as few as 50 or 60 copies or partial copies. And the closest of the great historical documents that we have from the time of the manuscript is almost, in some of the cases, 250 to 1,000 year gap. So what we have in our Bible as far as the manuscript evidence is amazing. We can go back and we can begin to compare original manuscripts, partial uh, fragments of, of manuscripts, and we start looking at them as compared to later copies, later translations, later translations, and amazingly... We can say, and this is not a Christian thing, a biased thing, this is just a simple historic archaeological fact that the manuscripts basically agree with each other to the degree of about 99.5%. That means the earliest manuscript partial pieces and full manuscripts that we have of the New Testament match up 99.5% with the rest of the later copies. And do you know what the variations are? Some of them are simple misspellings of names. Some of them are a simple number that is off. There is nothing, and, and no scholar, even an atheistic, anti-Christian scholar will deny this truth because it is fact that there is nothing in the manuscript evidence that we have found that has contradicted anything that we see in Scripture, that Scripture is amazingly consistent from the earliest manuscripts in large number to our current manuscripts. Now, that doesn't make Christianity true, and it certainly doesn't change the minds of atheistic, anti-Christian scholars and archaeologists, but it's an undeniable fact that first of all, the manuscript evidence that we have is amazing. And I would encourage you, there are so many great resources, including the fuller um, uh, book 
The Case for Christmas, the larger book. This is just excerpts of it and other great works that we'll be talking about over the next few weeks that can help you dig deeper and see that the manuscript evidence is amazing. But not only do we have manuscript evidence for the reliability of Scripture, but secondly, we have eyewitness evidence. I want you to think about what Luke says in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 2 of his Gospels. He writes, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the very first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. And that is our first question, isn't it? When something is being reported, we want to hear from the person who actually saw it happen. We want to ask, did you see it? Did you lay your own eyes on it? And we have in the Gospels, and I think most powerfully, in my opinion, from uh, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, both of which were written by Luke, some of the best historical eyewitnesses accounts of what happened in the life of Jesus in the early church. We know that Peter, who uh, we know the gospel of Mark is a record of his eyewitness accounts. We have 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Peter writes, we didn't follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Christ Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Now, of course, the skeptic would say, are, are these eyewitnesses reliable? I mean, this is the Bible after all. Now, the, the New Testament writers give the earmarks and give the signs of being actual uh, eyewitnesses, reliable eyewitnesses. And what we see in the gospel accounts, is an amazing, not only story of Jesus, but what we might call the peripheral story being so accurate and true. In other words, as we read, especially Luke and Acts and the other gospels, we see that it's recorded correctly, the the correct city locations. It even mentions dialects that we know historically are correct to that time. We have the record of emperors and who were governors and who were mayors at the time that the Gospels were written, all correctly uh, given by these eyewitnesses. They get roads correct. They even have how the roads connected in the ancient Roman world correct. They get obscure and remote customs correct when they talk about it. You see, one of the ways to judge the accuracy of an eyewitness is to see how accurate they are on the peripheral stuff, the details that aren't central to the story. And one of the amazing things about the Gospels in the New Testament is that there has never been a discovery that has contradicted any of those even peripheral truths that the Bible writers have given. Now, one would be very quick to say not every single detail given by the biblical writers we have archaeological evidence for, but that's also true of ancient uh, secular historians. We take what they say is true, not because we've seen the archaeological evidence, but we have come to believe that they were trustworthy eyewitnesses of history. And by any measure of the trustworthiness of eyewitness historians, the gospel writers uh, shine as some of the most reliable. The reality is when people lie, which is one of the common skeptic claims of the gospel writers, when someone lies, they tend to keep what they say very generic, not specific. Because the more details you lie about, the easier it is to get caught. Now, that's not a primer on how to lie. You don't hear me saying that. But the reality is that those who lie keep things generic. There's an innate sense that we know that we have to not give too many details, especially those that can be checked out. F.F. Bruce, who's a noted biblical scholar, says this, A writer who thus relates his story to the wider context of world history is courting trouble if he isn't careful. He affords the critical reader so many opportunities for testing his accuracy. Luke takes these risks and stands the test admirably. So the reality is that we can trust the eyewitness account 
of the Gospels. Now, the big question that we need to ask ourselves when we're confronted with this evidence is not just, wow, that's amazing, but the better question is, what accounts for this evidence? When we look at the manuscript evidence, when we look for the eyewitness evidence, and it it pans out, and it's legitimate, and it's trustworthy, we need to be asking ourselves the question, what accounts for this evidence? And really, the question, the answer is either going to be, it's truth, or it's not. The third type of evidence, very quickly, is what we would call extra-biblical evidence. Now, this is evidence outside of Scripture that shows that what Scripture says is trustworthy. And some people might say, is this really necessary? Shouldn't we just trust the Bible? And I don't think extra-biblical evidence is the linchpin or is necessary, but I think it's a tool that we can use to show the trustworthiness of Scripture. Because there are those, if you give the the evidence of the Scripture, the eyewitness and manuscript evidence might simply say, when you ask them, so do you believe it? They'll say, no, I don't. And we'll say, why not? And then they'll say, because it was written by Christians. And Christians were biased. Now, I think there's a lot of problems in that argument. There's a lot of logical fallacies. Just because you believe something doesn't mean you can't report it accurately. But we are blessed with very, uh, a very large amount of extra biblical sources that confirm the accuracy of scripture. These are sources that have nothing to do with the Bible written by non-Christians of the day that affirm many of the details in the New Testament as being true. I want to look at just one alone. And again, we could remember this is Costco. This isn't the full meal. But one of the best known secular Jewish historians of Jesus's and the gospel uh, time period was Flavius Josephus. He was a Jewish historian who lived from about A.D. 37 to A.D. 100. And he wrote many books chronicling history. They're accepted as reliable historical sources. They're not Christian. They're from a a Jewish to secular viewpoint. Listen to what he wrote when he was chronicling the history of the Jewish people. He writes, At the time of Pilate, (coughs) there was a wise man who was called Jesus. His conduct was good. He was known to be virtuous. Many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die, but those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders. Now, if you've never read that before, that's pretty striking. This is someone who doesn't have a dog in the fight, who isn't a Christian, who wasn't a follower of Jesus. So the question is, what accounts for this evidence? It's a pretty powerful picture. Not only was there Josephus, but there were about, there are in our possession, not mine, but in the world's possession of scholarship, about 43 different documents that are extra biblical from either Jewish or secular sources that cite the life of Jesus as historical fact. And do you know what these 43 documents basically tell us from non-biblical sources about Jesus historically? We know from just these extra biblical sources that Jesus lived during the time of Tiberius Caesar. We know, as Josephus said, that he was considered to have led a virtuous life. We know, number three, that these documents said that he was known to be a wonder worker. We know from these documents that he had a brother named James. We know from these documents that he was acclaimed or proclaimed by people to be the Messiah. We know from these documents that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate on the eve of the Jewish Passover. And we also know from these documents that there was darkness and an earthquake that happened when he died. What's amazing is these all fit to Scripture. And again, the question is, what accounts for this evidence? It's either truth or it's not. Fourth, there is what we would call internal evidence. And this is something that many historians call the principle of embarrassment. 
when we look internally to the Gospels, we see that unlike many fabricated stories where the author makes himself look good or the hero of the story to look so good, we see that the Gospel writers do something that is almost non-present in other historical documents. It's they report the truth even when it makes them look bad. Think about what the gospel writers all are willing to tell about themselves. Think of what Peter was willing to tell Mark, that Jesus had to look at him in the gospel of Mark and say, get behind me, Satan. If any of you were writing a fabricated story about yourself, would you add that? I wouldn't. We see that the gospel writers are willing to write about themselves as those who were cowardly, who doubted. They were willing to write about the fact that they ran away from Jesus when he was being crucified. They were even willing to have written about them and write about themselves that Jesus would teach them something continually and they were too dull to understand what he was saying. And then even think about what the gospel writers portray Jesus as. If you were trying to fabricate a story for people to follow, think about what you would make the hero of the story look like. Remember in the early part of the gospel account, James and even Mary and Jesus' family come and they think that he is mad. They think he's crazy. We also have it recorded in the scriptures that some thought Jesus was a drunkard. One of the most would have been embarrassing and scandalous stories, I don't think we quite understand this in our modern culture, was when the sinful woman came and took her long hair and broke the oil and wiped Jesus' feet, which we see rightly as a sign of her great love for Jesus, but would have also been a sexual come on by a prostitute in that day and age. And the gospel writers say Jesus allowed and argued for that to be done to him. Even his death. If you were trying to concoct a story to reach your fellow Jewish people, the last fabricated way you would have a savior or messiah die would be on a cross the jewish people considered the cross to be a curse and anyone on it to be cursed now we have a fully developed new testament theology that jesus took the curse for us and this it's this beautiful well laid out theological picture for us but for these first generation followers of christ if they were trying to fabricate a story of all the ways To draw a crowd or people to follow you across would be at the bottom of the list. So we have, number four, the internal evidence that is so strong. And again, what do we do with the evidence? What accounts for the evidence? And then finally, we have what I personally think is one of the most compelling parts of evidence for the the reliability of Scripture, and that is the post-gospel evidence. What we know happened to those who saw Jesus and claimed to see his resurrection, who believed he was born of a virgin. What happened to them after the gospel? Well, the reality is, and we know this, that to continue to follow Jesus and declare that he is God, that he was resurrected, he was born of a virgin, came with a, a deep price for the original disciples and followers of Jesus. First of all, For the followers of Jesus, for them to embrace the truth of Jesus meant that many of them lost their family connections, lost their livelihoods, they lost their place in society, their family rejected them, people wouldn't come and do business with them. Yet we see historically, we without a doubt, we see historically that hundreds and then thousands and thousands of these early eyewitnesses and people with faith refused to back down from their claim that Jesus was God. Secondly, to basically say you believed in Jesus and to follow Christianity meant to completely reject a religious lifestyle, really the very heart and soul of what generations of your family believe. To believe in Jesus being divine meant to to literally change your religion, which was at the fabric of everything you were. It basically went from saying, I believe that I must make a sacrifice, I must worship on the Sabbath, I must keep the law, to saying, 
It's about grace. That Jesus fulfilled the law. That I'm no longer bound by the Ten Commandments, but I'm bound by the law of love. And then finally, and this is what I think is most compelling, not only did many of these early believers who refused to back down from their claims of having seen the resurrected Jesus, believing he was born of a virgin, believing the supernatural, it came for many of them with the cost of their lives. We know that all but one, John, of the original disciples were killed for their faith. That every single one of them would rather have died than to simply recant what they saw to be true. Again, we can't go through all of them, but I think one of the most striking historical figures who died for the faith rather than deny what he knew was true was James, the brother of Jesus. Remember, James was the one who came. He was with his brothers who said, Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, you're crazy. They wanted to take Jesus away quietly. Yet by the end of his life, after he had walked with Jesus, after he had seen him resurrected, after he had been convinced of the the deity of Jesus, that he was the Son of God, James, the same one who wanted to put Jesus away for being crazy, was stoned to death for his faith while confessing that Jesus was the Son of God. The question that is often asked with this evidence is this. Would any of you die for a lie? Would any of you die for something you knew was a lie? Now, some people will say, oh, there are people who die for their religious beliefs all the time. Look at what ISIS does. Look at what other groups do. And I would say that is absolutely true. Many people will die for what they believe to be truth. But that's not the point. That's not the evidence. But does anyone die for something they know is a lie? I get that people die for what they think is true, and it's not necessarily true. But we're talking about a first generation of people who were so convinced by what they had seen, the evidence in front of them, that they were willing to die for what they knew was true. And again, I ask you, would you be willing to die for something you knew was a lie. Maybe one, maybe two, but 11, dozens if not hundreds of others who saw Jesus resurrected. So that's the foundation for what we're going to be talking about. How, How can we really believe these crazy stories? The Christmas story? Are you kidding me? Well, we're going to be looking, because we can trust the Bible, we can begin to believe and put our faith in the truth of the the Bible, the supernatural elements of virgin birth. Is there really evidence for that? Is that a reasonable thing to believe? What about the prophecies? What about this claim that Jesus is God in flesh? So what I want to challenge you to as you go is this. What are you really going to do with all of this evidence? If you're here and and you're convinced that this is true, can I encourage you to to make sure your life reflects the, the faith that you have in the truth of God's word? Are you in it daily? Are you reading it? The Bible is transformative. And even more, if you're here and you're convinced, I want to challenge you. Why don't you take these next four weeks and why don't you become even more adept at defending and communicating that? Grab this book. You know, go online and, and, and read some good resources from people like Ravi Zacharias and others. We're going to be talking about resources over these next three weeks. But if you're convinced, would you become more adept at sharing? Secondly, if you're here and you just doubt and you're like, I just can't buy the supernatural stuff. Can I challenge you? Would you come for the next three weeks with an open mind? There's nothing that I can say or anyone else could say, of course, that convince you. We unapologetically proclaim that what we're talking about is having faith, but it's faith with reason. It's a reasonable faith. And would you at least come? Would you be open to truth, whatever that truth is? I'm not afraid of truth. I want to challenge you to not be afraid of truth. 
that there could be a supernatural element to our existence. That there could be a God who loves you. And this God who loves you and created this world could have sent his son. He was God in the flesh. And can I tell you, he desires a relationship with you. Would you be open-minded? And then finally, if you're here like most who are like, I believe, but I struggle, would you just take these next few weeks to really say, God, would you help me in my heart to really believe, to understand, to know? And I want to challenge you, let this be not just the end of what you do with being able to defend your faith, but could this be the appetizer for you? Could this be the first bite that causes you to be willing to study more and to go deeper. As we close this morning, I want to pray for us, and I want to pray that God would use these next three weeks to encourage our faith and to show us why we can have faith and trust and hope in the story of Christmas. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. It is amazing. Lord, we thank you for how accurate and true and reliable it is. Lord, we thank you that... uh, uh, we can uh, see you and know you through the truth that it reveals. Lord Jesus, I pray for all of us that you would take us where we are right now in our faith and trust in you, and you would grow us and move us and draw us to yourself. Father, may uh, we be faithful to study, to be open-minded, to dig and to contemplate and to think, because we know you will be faithful to reveal yourself to us. Father, we thank you this morning, and as we are dismissed, we pray that you would uh, go with us, not only to our Sunday school classes, but out of these walls, uh, outside these walls, to be those who uh, bring uh, hope and joy and truth to those around us. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we ask all of these things this morning in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed this morning.